Today we are discussing Freeport, McMoran, Copper, and Gold Company, ticker FCX. Over the next few minutes, I'll discuss my thoughts on both the valuation of this company and its business quality. First up, we can see the market cap is $58 billion, enterprise value of $59.5 billion, so you see about $1.5 billion in net debt. Overall, that's almost immaterial on the size of this business, so I wouldn't even worry about it. You have the metals and mining industry. They engage in mining and mineral properties in North America, South America, and Indonesia. Um, so it's important because it's not just the U us north america but it's also a few other regions but it's also not worldwide the explore for copper gold silver and other metals as well as oil and gas they have some key assets suhi so grasberg minerals district in indonesia um, a few in arizona new mexico colorado as well as peru and chile in south america so that's important from the sense that for these types of companies you want to be really concerned about um risk in terms of expropriation where those assets could be taken over so you want to understand is indonesia peru chile and the united states key areas where you think the governments may or may not take over those assets and of course their oil and gas properties are in california and the gulf of mexico um so there's some name changes as well. Beta of 2.0, share turnover to 108%. This beta is a, important because it tells you that it's going to be a relatively high volatility stock when the normal beta for an S&P 500 company is 1.0. 2.0 means it's going to be out twice as volatile. If the stock if market's up 1%, then this is telling you that, that this company is likely to be up 2% and vice versa. So stock's down 1%, this company could be down 2% in a similar sort of range. It's going to be about twice as volatile. Now, that is to, to be a sign of an average or lower quality company, that higher volatility tends to reflect higher volatility in the underlying business, which would match up well with my understanding for the metals and mining industry, which tends to be a relatively high volatility industry. The reason for that is they don't control the price of their product. They don't control the price of copper. They don't control the price of gold, silver, and other metals. And when you don't control the price of your product, you're on the lower end of the quality spectrum. Low quality average businesses tend to be where that falls return on invested capital, you tend to see the cyclical nature here in this chart. You can easily see the cycles that they go through. So they hit an up cycle in 2006, 41% return on invested capital, down cycle in 2008, losing a significant amount of money. Up cycle in 2010, 21%, down cycle in 2015, losing 28%. Not only do they have losses in these years, but these are very, very large losses. So you see four years of, five years of losses over the last two decades. So that's about 25% of the time they're losing money. That's a relatively high number. And again, would be a sign this is a lower quality business. Not to mention that they're losing money. When they do lose money, these are significant losses. 50% of invested capital was a loss in 2008, 28%. So you're talking about half and close to a third, maybe about a fourth of your invested capital in these types of time frames, which is a very significant amount for when those losses occur. So you can see when the prices of the commodities that they're producing drop significantly, they really struggle. So Yes, they have some really good years here. 41% in 2006, 21% in 2010. 21 and 41 are very good numbers. The problem is, is when you average those out with losses, it doesn't look as good. And likewise, the upper part of their cycles recently have not been as good as they were in the past. 2021, you see a 10% return on invested capital, 8% in 2018. So again, the, the business isn't reaching those super high highs, which you absolutely need in a commodity business in order to offset the years when you have losses. Overall, this chart's telling me the business is cyclical, which matches my understanding of the industry, and that they have some decent amount of losses in there, relatively low quality business. You see that backed up by my 10 year median returns, 4% return on invested capital, 7% return on equity. Neither of these is double digit, which, which means it's hard for an investor that holds these shares over the long term to achieve a double digit return. So how do you achieve a double digit return with this type of business? You buy during the very bad parts of the cycle where everyone hates it, and you sell during the up parts of the cycle. This is like a trading stock. These are the types of things where if you know how to time it, which I certainly don't, but if you know how to time it, you can make a lot of money buying commodity businesses because of the cycles they go through if you're able to time the cycles well. I don't recommend that, 
but it is something that people try and do. Now the valuation ratio PE of 16.7. We're gonna to have to do a deep dive on the valuation into the numbers here as we look into these earnings numbers because one of the things with these volatile stocks, with these commodity stocks, is a lot of times you have to be careful because they might be a better buy at a high PE ratio than when they're at the low PE ratio because a low PE ratio is likely to correlate to these upper peaks in return on invested capital, but this would be a terrible time to buy. A lot of times you're gonna have a low PE ratio when you buy during the low parts of the cycle and then or you're going to have a high PE ratio in the low parts, low PE ratio at the high parts. And so it kind of goes against your natural inclination. So 16 normally I'd say, Hey, PE of 16 is pretty reasonable price with the cyclical business. You have to be a little bit more careful. 10 year Kagers. You can basically see this company is not really growing um, on any sort of sustainable manner. 2% revenue growth, that's what you see here, $20 billion in revenue to $22 billion in revenue. So you get 2% a year, that's about 20% over the course of the decade, that's what we see. Your assets are growing a little faster, which is why your returns are getting a little bit worse over the course of a decade. Now your free cash flow is up a lot, but I'm assuming this is because the free cash flow was actually very minimal 10 years ago, so I wouldn't really you know, think much into this number. And of course, EPS is down. So this could be down for a few reasons, could be down to dilution or just some sort of, you know, mismanagement of the overall operating profits. Now, one thing that's really interesting here is you have to be very, very careful when you see something like this. When we look at 2013 and 2014, this is tells you a lot about what this business goes through because you can see that they declined by 4% in revenue. And yet gross profits declined by like 80%. You've went from 6.2 billion in gross profits to 1.5 billion in gross profits. Your gross profit margin went from 30% to 7.5%. Anytime you see this in a single year, it is devastating to the predictability of the business. This on its own would be a reason for me to not buy the stock. Because what you see the next year in 2015, when they have a bigger revenue decline of 27%, the gross profit goes negative, gross profit margin becomes negative, and then it just absolutely destroys the the profitability of this business. I mean, look at this loss here, $11.31 lost in a single year. And it looks like that's almost like a whole decade's worth of earnings lost in this three-year period, which is really the problem. These three years of losses outstrip, I believe, the other seven years of gains, even though you only lost money in three years out of the 10 years, they were such huge losses that they wiped out those other years of gains. And that's a big problem for you as a shareholder because it means as a long-term shareholder, you get into massive trouble there. It's also why you see the dividend getting cut off because they're losing so much money there. And of course, these really big negative returns on equity, negative returns on invested capital. And of course, when you have that sort of bad negative leverage, this is how you get something like this return on invested capital. Negative 28% turns on to a negative 67% return on equity. It basically wipes out your equity of by two thirds in a single year of losses. And it's because this big change in revenue growth completely destroyed your gross profit margin, let alone your operating profit, and so on and so forth. So yes, your EPS has declined from $2.64 to $2.39, but I don't even know if I can rely on that number. I mean, when we look at this $2.39, you can see that match up pretty well with our 16 times PE. But what are you gonna earn next year? What are you gonna earn five years from now? I have no idea. When you look at this history, there's no sort of predictability year to year, and that's a major concern as a potential shareholder. You can't predict the future with this business, and so that becomes an instant red flag before you'd wanna buy. Now, um, let's go on to the income statement next. If you're enjoying this video, if you're learning something, please hit that like button. You don't have to like the stock. It's about learning, education, trying to understand how to evaluate these businesses. And in this case, we're really trying to look what are these red flags because you are going to want to be able to do this yourself, understand what not to buy. So income statements. Again, anytime you're seeing this flip of negative gross profit margins, again, I like to have companies that are profitable on a net income basis every year. But even if they're not profitable on a net income basis every year, they better be profitable on an operating gross profit basis. Once you start losing money on a gross profit basis, that's a really big red flag. You have two years here with negative gross profits. So here you see that in 2014, they had positive gross profits, positive operating profits, and then you know they end up in negative net income because of interest and other things. But they still had that positive gross profit. But 2015 and 2016 are the big problems because if you have negative gross profit margins, all of your SGNA is gonna do, all that headcount, all your employees are just gonna send it even worse. You're gonna lose even more money. All this interest expense can't be covered, losing even more money, et cetera, et cetera, down the line. And that can become a major problem. 
one of the things I mentioned at the beginning is like, okay, so why did the EPS decline even though our revenue is up 2% per year? And it's because of dilution. You can easily see here that you started with a billion shares outstanding. You end with 1.4 billion shares outstanding. So you see about 44 to 45% dilution over the course of a decade. That's going to add somewhere between 3 and 4% per year of negative growth to your operating line. So like if we say, okay, revenue 2.5% becomes negative negative two and a half percent, that's about your 4% difference there. You can completely cover the difference between your revenue growth and your PS growth simply by the dilution we're seeing on the income statement line. That's why we keep doing these analysis even when we know this isn't really a business that I'm interested in, it's not gonna be on my watch list. There's still more you can learn from doing these deeper dives. Let's go into the balance sheet now. One of the things we mentioned is there's not a lot of debt here, which is interesting because you do see debt on the balance sheet. It looks like they've been paying it down decently over the course of the decade. I do like to see that they've paid down this debt. You can see that although they had $37 billion in debt or liabilities at the beginning, you know, in 2013, they got it back down to 26 billion, you know, 9 billion in debt over the course of the decade. So it is good to see that they brought down some of the risk by, you know, selling back that debt. Now I said though, they only really have one and a half billion dollars in net debt. And that is because they have this $8 billion in cash and equivalents. So the debt picture doesn't look as bad as it would seem because they have all that cash to offset it. Ideally, I'd like to see the debt kind of eliminated. A cyclical business, debt can be really, really detrimental for them because what happens in those years that you have your negative gross profit, you can't even cover your interest expense. It introduces the impact of potential default. This would be a much safer business if it was run with no debt. And so I would hope that the management would work towards paying off that debt and just running it without debt in the future. Still going to be a rough business business, but that eliminates one of the major risks for shareholders in a company like this, which would be default and bankruptcy. And you don't want that as a shareholder because it wipes out your equity. Um, yeah. Okay. So let's go to the cash flow statement. Uh, depreciation. One of the things here is you see depreciation is much lower than all your PP and E. Maybe not all your PP and E. You had some early years here. Um, let's see. Let's look at this six year period, 2016 to 2011 or 2021, you can see that depreciation is actually higher than your pp e in some years, and then it kind of offsets and bounces around. That's a good sign. It means they're not like overspending one way or another. Maybe they're being less capital intensive in the future. It means some of this, you know, excess spending on assets, which you see here with this assets growing faster than revenue may turn around in the future. Um, maybe they've gotten some discipline in the last 10 years that they may not have had at the beginning of the last 10 years. And so that might, could be a better situation um, from a cash flow perspective. Looks like they had some acquisitions here. You can see they're taking on this debt. They are issuing stock a few times uh, and there's no sort of sign of steady buybacks or anything like that. Um, you do have buybacks the last two years, so that is a little curious. Um, again, I, I don't mind buybacks, but I would really like the debt to be paid off first. It's just such a big risk in this business. Um, you can see the cash from dividends bouncing around so much, not very predictable. That lack of predictability is a bit red mark for me because it means to me, that's not something I'm gonna wanna invest in. So. Overall, Freeport, uh, McMoran, Copper and Gold, ticker FCX, for me is a pass. It's not gonna go on my watch list. Why is that? One, cyclicality. Two, you have five years of losses in the last 20 years. That's simply a sign of a relatively low quality business. Your 10 year median returns are too low. They're below 10%. It's not good enough for me. I really want my revenue and EPS growth to be approaching the eight to 12% range. And you're at a negative EPS growth. The reason for the negative EPS growth is you have 4% dilution per year. Again, that's really high um, and becomes a major damper on your, your business. And finally, they have a significant amount of debt that I would really like paid off with the excess cash that they have. If they did that, that could improve the metric for the business, but there's really no way to control for the cyclicality and the losses. So Overall, for me, I'm going to pass on Freeport, McMoran, Copper, and Gold. If you enjoyed this video, if you learned something, hit that like button. Don't forget to subscribe. I'm working through every company in the SP 500. If you want to see the companies I like, the good companies in the SP 500, my very favorite, it's the watch list playlist right up, right up above. I hope you'll check out that watch list. I'm working through every company that I think is really, really good and worth looking at as well. And if you want to learn how to use software like this, this is quickfs.net. The f link is in the description below. That's my affiliate link. Please consider using that link to sign up. It's a great way to support the channel and I can get a commission for sending you over there. And this is the software I use every day to analyze stocks. Thank you for listening. Until next time, stop paying fees, start building wealth.